This is probably the most famous one from the ancient times, right? So I think you've seen that in some movies already. And probably you know all about these pyramids because they're so abstract and people even say it was built by aliens, right? So, but as you will see today, the pyramid was developed. It not just happened, so I don't believe it's made by aliens. So first of all, where are we? So the blue circle on the map is where we are today. So the one on the bottom, the most bottom left circle or oval. That's actually the area around the river called Neil. The Neil, maybe you have heard that already. And the blue circle is where it is. And if we zoom in a bit, you see in the timeline, the Egyptian one is really like, it has North and South Egypt, but still it's kind of one empire, which is more or less continuously decidable in three big kingdoms. And this is like one big kingdom that were aware of their own kingdomness. <laughs> so they see themselves as a kingdom unlike the other two high cultures. So, and here you see the timeline. So we divide it roughly, as I said, into three kingdoms, old, middle, and new kingdom. So easy to remember. You, it's enough when you remember that it went from 2,700 until 1,000 before Christ and that you can divide it into three kingdoms. If you want to read more, I put the, the Wikipedia art article is actually quite good. That's why I linked it there. Wikipedia is not always reliable, right? Because it's not written by experts. So it's just... Yeah, everybody can edit it, but actually this article I read, I had a look into it and I found it quite good. So I put it there and you see there was like the blue bars are like intermediate period. So it was shortly interrupted basically when one pharaoh spent too much money and the country got uh, bankrupt. So on the yellow ones on the bar on the top of the page are the high, the call it golden ages. So like the, the interesting period. So the old, the middle and the new kingdom. And the pyramids actually were developed in the early times. So interesting enough, they came up around 2,650. So just after the, the old empire kind of started. And they were developed, as I explained today, but <clears throat> they were just happened in that old empire. And they were actually too expensive. So also the first real pyramids after a few starts, the pyramids of Giza, are around 2550. So the biggest ones are the first. And they actually make the state and they're like finally bankrupt so yeah and um, they were simply too expensive so that's why the later um kingdoms they also built some pyramids but smaller ones and not so many and they're not so famous and many also not preserved because they were smaller but the first ones were actually the biggest and they also happened in the old kingdom and the first one so i will explain that they're usually around 2650 until 2200 something they were built um okay and <clears throat> this is the map where neil is where the neil is so it goes linear from the north and to the south and you can make a division there between the upper and the so the northern and the southern egypt so that's where the dash line is then uh, south of dashur but because the delta has more more um fru fruitable land and um the city is basically go go south from from the from the ocean down to the from the mediterranean sea actually to the um yeah down the river so that's why we found all the pyramids next to the river and the pyramids are mostly on the west because that's where the sun sets so and the, the people believe the king should be buried it's a grave the pyramid is a grave monument right that's for the grave of the king it's not a temple it's a grave monument so they, they are all built on the west of the Neil because that's the site where the sun set. So that's where the king should be buried on that side and not on the east. So, and yeah, this is how a pyramid look like. But as you can see, this is just a modern inspiration. <laughs> the famous one in, in the Louvre in France, right? Designed by Yu Ming Pei in 20th century. And that's the real one. So these are the most famous ones, the pyramids of Giza. So actually the largest is the right one. It just looks smaller. The largest is on the right and it's also the oldest. And this is, this is what I call the abstract um, shape. I will explain that further later. And overall, if we go to the stylistics, we have an interesting, again, like antagonism. So antagonism is when two things stand opposite, but at the same time. So when it's antagonistic, between 15th and 18th century, we can also call it antagonistic, but it's not so interesting. It's interesting when the same tendencies exist at the same time, right? 
And in Egypt, they have this, what I call geometric shapes. In a second, I will speak about geometric and organic as a term in architecture. And the geometric shapes, which are really this form of abstraction. I will explain later also why I think this is like a symbol for intelligence. I will explain that together with how I believe the, the, the Egyptian people also thought about it. So I think that's their thoughts as well. So the pure right is that the more you derive, how you say, you develop it until kind of the peak, of, in, in the end, one sentence comes out, right? The essence of, for example, what you done yesterday or of the shape. So in this case, the shape, they had this obelisk as a symbol, uh, this kind of needle-like monument. It's just a monument and the pyramid then as an abstract shape as well. And also the, the columns. Now it's funny, the columns, we have this kind of what we call tectonic. Tectonic is on the left when actually you show the forces in the building element. So you show that that the, the force from the beam was brought to the ground. That's actually the idea of the, or the force of the ceiling or the roof are brought to the ground by a column. And you show this in the column, then you call it tectonic. So that's under the gray ones in the middle of that slide. Okay, so in the middle of the slide, you see the tectonic slide, uh, um, not slides, the tectonic columns. They show how the forces go from the roof, the ceiling, or the beam to the ground. And on the right side are the, the columns that are more likely used in Egypt. They're actually organic. That means they use uh, flower-like, like vegetarian, call it vegetarian, like vegetarian, but vegetarian, ornament to decorate it so that comes from the flowers which is a bit untypical that they do it on the columns but the, they use it as a decoration so as you see on the right and um so they have both but mostly we have these so-called papyrus columns and they also add the organic so the from the nature coming ornament onto yeah they're onto nearly everything so on the right side you see in the top of a building Called Higazim, so the, the the very uh, bottom picture on the right side of the slide. It's like the the top ending of an of an pylon in this case, and they design it like an organic way. And also the decoration that you see there um, is added onto the uh, onto the geometric form. So they first usually create a geometric form and then add the organic decoration on it. In Egypt, I will show that soon in the photo. But first, I want to talk roughly about these two terms because they're often used geometric and organic architecture. So that's why I call it excursus. That means we talk shortly about it for three minutes and then I go back. So the left side is geometric architecture. And you put has a modern house there from Le Corbusier and the pyramids. And then actually what they call the platonic solids in the middle. I will explain them later together with the pyramids. So this geometric, it means it's an abstraction that we actually cannot find like this in nature. And then actually people came and say, yeah, but let's do houses also like this. And as we know, the very early houses, like the oval houses, they're actually more nature-like. And it took a way of abstraction. Uh, I call the first archi architectonic revolution when a roundish house, the oval house became rectangular. Because rectangular shapes you can add easily onto each other. You can put something on the wall and they, ha they are easy for planning, but they don't appear like this in nature. So this is a really like a first task of human mind to create rectangular floor plans. So geometric, for me, architecture is the opposite of nature because we can live in a forest, but the human is not enough. So uh, the human condition is not good enough. It's not enough to live in the nature. So we need architecture as a third skin, right? So an, an animal can live in the nature and have the, the fur, but we are naked, we have just the skin, so we put the second skin like animal's fur, actually we use animal fur, nowadays cotton or whatever, or even chemistry furs, to cover our bodies and then we build architecture as we call the third skin. So, and it's, it's artificial, it's not nature. So for me, architecture is kind of the opposite than nature and it should be, it's a cultural product. For example, in landscape architecture, we divide into nature space and culture space. Culture space or culture, cultural landscape is everything inf influenced by human. So when we build a footpath in the, in the forest, it's also culture space because we build the, the, the walkway or we, we cut the tree 
then it's also already man influence. It's not natural anymore. So, and then there were people that the pictures on the right side are example that said, Naya, but let's, let's build like the nature is let's imitate it. So the house on the bottom is a bit a cute, maybe funny example, but there are actually pl plenty, not too many, but some famous or less famous ones where people imitate. Yeah nature by building these shapes so they, they this is what but most commonly uh, the term organic architecture is used for um, but i disagree with that because for me this architecture is not organic because it's a not grown by itself b it cannot move it's it's like static right you build it maybe in concrete or stone but you can uh, kick your foot against it and it will not move one centimeter so it's it's not movable at all it's not flexible and number c this is the main one it doesn't develop. I mean, you, you actually can separate like living and dead objects, right? By saying the living objects change. So they either grow or die. So they become bigger or smaller. So that's why you people also say when you when you're too boring and just sit at home, you kind of die inside because you're not developing, you're not growing. So every tree, every leaf grows and develops. So this is for me, the main criterion about nature, it evolves by itself and it's changing. And Organic architecture, even like modern ones building concrete, look very, they can look like nature, but they just imitate the form and finally it's static. It will not move, it will not change one centimeter over 200 years. So that's why I find, first, I disagree with the term, and second, also a bit with the idea because we just imitate the shape of nature, but it's not nature. It's still the same static like on the left side or the geometric architecture. By the way, the, by the way, the term geometric is not so common. Organic is a common term to describe that. But I find the term wrong, but still, it's the common term. Geometric is just, uh, you don't call it an organic architecture, right? Because all architectures, as I said, an organic. So let's use these terms, geometric, organic. Here I put my beloved Louis Kahn again. Are you sure? I showed them to you last semester. So he really used the basic geometric shapes like close to the platonic solids, square, circle, um, and how you call it? Like a, like a, um, yeah, these kind of solid uh, platonic shapes. So simple geometric shapes and add them together. On the right side is a famous and maybe quite, how you say, turned out to be quite good building of what they call organic architecture. So the architect that's mostly linked with that in a successful way, so not just these cute houses there on the countryside, <coughs> is Hans Sharon. You see on the right side his name. And he is linked with that probably most than more, more than the other architects. Also Frank Frank uh, Lloyd Wright built houses and is sometimes linked with that name. And you see Gaudi for, on, on this slide before the church was from Gaudi. But he said also, yeah, architecture should be like nature and organized. So this is a concert hall in Berlin and you see um, the, the floor plan is still symmetric of this concert hall, but it's like, it should be like in the wine hill. So it should be like, like nature plates around the orchestra. And also on the floor plans on the right on the top right side you see it better there's a private house so he didn't build it like on the left side you see rectangles and squares and circles this is louis Kahn again on the left and on the right of my slide you see in the top right corner a house i think this represents a bit organic so every cell is different every apartment is different the house the, the walls are mainly not parallel but you see already in the bedrooms he made them parallel because you need to put the furniture and the store uh, and the closet and the bed but wherever he can, like in the living room and so on, the walls are not rectangular. But I don't know if this is more functional than the rectangular ones. I think not. But he kind of imitate, want to try a, a nature-made floor plan. So he want to imitate the nature by that. But actually, in my opinion, yeah, it's still uh, fixed. I mean, once it's built, it's static. It's not moving. It will not develop. It will always stay like that until you demolish it. And it's built in concrete. So it's not nature. But it imitates the shape of the nature. And the better version, it's both the same architects. On the right side, the house in Berlin, I think, designed apartment house by Sharon. And he built in Germany a lot. And on the left, the better one. So the concert hall is kind of a good example, I would say. This also sounds very good, by the way, the Philharmonic in Berlin. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's symmetric as you see in the floor plan, but it's really, it should be built organically around the orchestra. So that was the idea in the 1950s, the Philharmonie in Berlin. Yeah, so left organic, right, uh, left geometric on the right side organic, or what people call organic architecture, what's the common 
term for that. And this is, in my opinion, the only way how really organic architecture could look like. This is the Smurf village, you know, the Smurfs maybe or not. In German, we call it Schlümpfe. Uh, so this organic architecture, I assume that these houses should not be built. If they're built in concrete by the Smurfs, then this also not organic. But I assume, I assume this should be real mushrooms. So they're actually living in mushrooms, right? These little blue Smurfs. If they do so, this is organic architecture. But there you see already the problem that actually if the if the mushroom dies or become bigger or smaller, the window will fall out. You see they put windows and doors in the mushroom, which are man-made already. So it's like a yeah, it's like a chain that they already influence the nature form of the mushrooms. And if the mushroom dies or grows, the window will not work anymore and the door also. So you have a problem already. And on the right side, I put that picture. I think it's from Minecraft or from kind of a computer game. I, I don't know that game, but it's a bit funny because they kind of imitate this uh, organic mushroom with a cubic form. So there you see already. For me, architecture is always kind of, yeah, I don't know, it makes more sense if it's geometric. But this would be real organic architecture, in my opinion, if it was real mushroom that you live in. So, and but actually for the cities, it works. Yeah, I said last time already, I believe organic urban design exists because you have, and this is from my last lecture, because even the earliest time in Mesopotamia, we have both. We have on the right side the organically growing city. So this I will call organic because the elements are also houses. They are inorganic, they are static, but and the city is not planned. So it has this overall shape, oval, sorry, overall oval shape, <laughs> an oval shape that actually is kind of just happened a bit. It's not planned. And also elements are added like kind of planless and even streets. And this is Ur. This is a very, one of the very earliest city in the south of Mesopotamia, right? In the, uh, in the um, Sumerian, where the Sumer lived. And in Mesopotamia, we had both. So on the left side, as I explained last time, is a floor plan of the of the ideal city Dur Sharukin in the north in the Assyrian. So the Assyrian people built that, which is planned. It's, it has a square shape. It's a nearly perfect square. And they put intentionally the government buildings and the and the near the walls. So outside of the city, they thought it's more safe to defend it than to defend the building and the city together when it's not in the middle and they plan the cities and they also build the sub uh, sorry they, they plan the streets as a grid and they plan the neighborhood so everything is planned so this i would call geometric again so in urban design indeed i would i would say you have both you have geometric planned cities and i would use like to use the term organic because it's grown unplanned uh, for urban design and here you see also in some screenshots from current google earth <coughs> The American cities usually follow the same principle. This is Washington DC, but it was invented in the 18th century, I think by a French called uh, L'Enfant with family name. What's his given name? Charles L'Enfant, I forgot, Charles L'Enfant. Uh, his family name was L'Enfant. So he was asked to design Washington and he invented this, what I call American system. So you first connect the important points with linear streets and then you put actually a grid of squares nearly squares or rectangulars of they call them avenue and street right and then count them one two three four five avenue one two three four five street over it so they put this rectangular grid nearly on every city in america so that's geometric or planned city and they do it with every city even if it matched the the topography or not and in other countries you still have both uh, like in Europe, in many cities, you have geometric. And on the right side is a screenshot from Google Earth from a German small city in the middle of Germany, where, you, where I think you can see quite well how it's kind of grown around main axis. It's a bit like a leaf, right? It's grown from the center up the hill. And then first the, the main street grows. And then to the side, there are substreets growing. I think you can find even more organic ones. But this is it's just kind of happened. It, didn't, it was not planned as a whole, right? So this term geometric, organic, I would use for city planning. I think for urban design, they make sense. For architecture, not so much in my opinion. So, but that's just, that's just my opinion. So back to Egypt, they had at least tectonic elements and then covered them with organic forms. Uh, first, I'll show you this one because it's so good example. Um, so on the left side is, is this kind of abstract, this kind of conic, very, very stable, form right also it's it's axial it's symmetric it's very monumental already on the left side um but it has this overall abstract form geometrized 
you want me to try it? Yeah. And then it's the, the the ornament is laid over it. So it's it's this kind of sunken relief we call it. So it's like it's craved inside the stone. And some are hieroglyphs, these symbols, some are just flowery elements, and they're just like like a pattern all over. And the right side in the small box, it's a part of a temple in Karnak, you also you can also see it. It's this very simple block. And then the ornament is carved inside the stone. And back to this slide. Here you see the strengths also in the besides this geometric form and this they're very calm you know they're, they're they're very abstract but in the simpleness also very calm so they always have as you see on the on the bottom in the edfu temple and the horus temple in edfu you see a horizontal surrounding wall that surrounds the whole complex that's yeah kind of laying right and has very static calm appearance that's is in contrast to the vertical but also because of the, the conic shape also um very calm and heavy shape right it's not a light structure it's vertical but it's not flying or something it lays very heavily the the two entrance uh polygons that the, the propylene that actually always mark the or nearly always mark the entrance of a temple complex so you have this contrast of the horizontal and the vertical forms and both is very calm and and yeah abstract so and that's why monumental and also the, on the picture on the top, the Diosa complex, you see it again, you see a, a preform of the pyramid, in this case a ziggurat, again, like the ziggurat in Mesopotamia, but not as a temple, but just a shape. So, well, we also call them ziggurat. So, uh, it was a grave monument, the vertical shape, and it's contrast with the ho long horizontal line. So, it's this is very monumental, very calm, a bit heavy, but I find also timeless, very timeless, beautiful, heavy, monumental forms. So, and yeah, this one I had already. Yeah, for urban design, so the next two or three topics are urban design and palaces. It's not so interesting. It, it's I make this a bit shorter because I want to have more time for the pyramids and for the second part of the presentation. First of all, the, the sacred buildings like pyramids are built in stone. That's why they're preserved. But actually, <coughs> like these cities and private houses and also even king palaces were built in clay and wood. That's why they're already gone. They are taken away by the river, basically, over the centuries. So there's nothing much left we can find. So we don't really know how the palaces and everything look like so well. We can just assume but the pyramids and the sacred architecture, so for the gods, for the spiritual side was built in stone so in a different material because it should be timeless so they are preserved so in the cities as well this Theban is not preserved well we just assume it was like geometric planned not surprising when you look on the other architecture that they plan their cities well unlike for example in the Aegean culture um, and it's actually planned very well it has even water in the middle like that um, that brings uh, that makes the climate in the city better surrounded by the rivers as cities are mostly and has a rectangular grid and the representative buildings the three in the center and here it's even further they plan like an ideal ideal city center i don't want to talk too long about that and these are like private houses as we assume that they look like on the right side you see quite luxury already version of a, of a villa but from these, as I said, they were building clay. It's not much left, so we can just kind of guess, and, and we, we 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 they are not preserved basically. So they are sunken and gone, while the sacral architecture remains. So I want to talk more about that. That's how we assume a palace looked like. So a very large complex, very representative. With, yeah, I mean that the pharaoh was seen as a living god, as I said. So there's a mixture in Egypt between the spiritual side, the gods and the reality so the pharaoh was kind of seen the pharaoh was the highest king right seen as a living god and when he dies he became he become a god so that's why the palace should of course represent this very high status in this quite hierarchical society so you see it's symmetric as an axial uh symmetry in in the in the where number two is in, in the middle hall and then apartments to the side and it's organized representatively but as I said, not, not not preserved, so I can't show you any pictures. But the temples, they're more interesting. So I want to focus on that. This is the first one uh, in Karnak. 
it's a big complex which is quite well preserved so you see a picture here there's a photo right and um yeah it's uh well preserved and because it's built in stone so and um the great thing about this one is mainly what they call the hypo style or hypo stool, how they said that time it's basically like i put on the floor plan on the right it's basically a dark a dark hall with a lot of these kind of papyrus columns and you see on the picture on the left how large they are so the roof is gone but the the hall, the columns are there so you'd have to imagine there was a roof over it and you can see it was a dark there was no natural light in it a dark column hall that you have to walk through from the entrance to the next section so they were always like the temples were very designed sequences of bright and dark spaces and just in the middle the columns are bigger right they're taller to mark the middle line the symmetry and there's uh, a light coming from the top um, of, of the two sides as you see in the section on the left side so the light coming in and showing the way where you have to walk through but this kind of light as you can imagine to the left and the side became darker and darker and darker so it's kind of a column forest this which is just like very monumental and and representative maybe make you a little bit fear when you walk through but that's the kind of feeling of respect that you people should have towards the godness right it's a temple for for the gods so um that means this it's a very uh very representative and strong gesture there this kind of hypostyle this kind of a hall full of columns yeah, and you walk through the middle where you can see a little bit through the windows but also not too much should be quite dark as well the whole room yeah and um this is how it looks now and again in the columns are carved the the hieroglyphs the symbol as a relief inside so this contrast of this very heavy architecture and this very vegetan so floral ornament on the top and that's the floor plan so that's all the same temple we're just zooming in from the left that's the overview of the karnak temple and you see there's two entrances and you see how huge it is it's like one one kilometer in a square you see there's the 100 meter scale so in one of these halls the for example the hypostyle is already 120 meters in the horizontal dimension and around i think 80 or 70 in the in the second dimension so it's this is the same floor floor plan this one right and um you see also the height in the comparison it's like how high is that one this is a human 20 30 meters i don't know so they're really huge and so we're zooming in on the left uh, and then on the top right is a zoom in through the whole main temple and on the bottom right is a zoom in again on the main core and that's what i actually palmy are you there uh, i mentioned the last presentation of palmy uh, uh, the final presentation of semester one they like these sequences you remember how palmy's pavilion led through the dark and to the bright and and back this pavilion at the canal. So I mentioned to Palmy in the final presentation, look on the Egyptian temples. I mean, for example, this one. So when you look on the top right side, you see very well how it started with a dense space where, where you go through the very thick entrance wall, right? Where the one is written through open hall, but it has columns on the side and through a small pre, pre chamber, like a pre room. I'm now on the top right, on the top right slide, uh, part of the slide. Then a very small one, and then it's bigger again, you, you arrive in the hypo style in this kind of endless space of columns and it becomes smaller again. And then you're outside again at the courtyard. So you have a sequence always outside, inside, bright and big and dark and small rooms and sometimes also bright and narrow. And so you really have a sequence of spaces but, 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 where you got brought through. That's why I mentioned to Palmy. So it's really like, like a storytelling. I really like this and it's all axial. It's all on one line. So you never have to go left or right. You come in at the front on the left side of a drawing and you go one 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 until then it becomes more small and small and small and on the end you end up in the what is dark red so this is the most holy temple so this is the sacred kernel so the core that's actually quite small right um and there you got like you got a focus so from the very big and you look on the top right side of my slide again in the very big courtyard it kind of focus your attention through the hypostyle, through another courtyard, smaller, 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 and then in the like human-like scale, maybe there's a six meters wide or something, human-like scale of the very core. And this is surrounded again by small courtyards, so you see the small yellow ones. So you're on another scale. So it's really like very representative sequence bringing you through the entrance. So this is a great, I think a great floor plan, a great work of architecture. 
how far people thought already like to influence the human feeling by rooms that you got brought through right so rooms are able to influence emotions a lot and this is like a prime example i think is really great so here's like one of the sequences so you really walk through this huge axial symmetric monumental heavy stone forms and then uh, they also shape sometimes there are these columns and on the right side you see these are uh, rectangular columns rectangular square and uh, in front are these kind of statues standing there looking at you all the same so it looks like an army so this kind of repetition of all the same is kind of an element of representative architecture too it works quite well when you build a row of all the same it usually has a kind of a bit yeah representative influence on the on the visitor so yeah, you walk through this in this case a courtyard from outside to inside it's, it's really great and here you have another example on the left and here there are, these are the small temples that are added i just added them in they're on the same land of karnak just to show you this kind of abstract cubic form and another great but a bit smaller temple is the the horus temple so here the, the entrance is very well preserved so we can look how this very abstract strong form stand or like a monument in the desert right and you get brought again through courtyards the same principle as in Karnak but smaller as you see in the floor plan or the bottom of the slide from a again you have this dense entrance situation that you've got like squeezed when you walk through the black block right it's like and it has a small opening in the middle as you can see it's very narrow a small opening narrow so you get kind of concentrated like like squeezed through and then you're in the biggest space the the courtyard kind of where you see the picture on the right side and you face already this uh, temple entrance which is higher than the rest so it's kind of pointed out and it has a, has a frame again around it same like the what I showed you at uh, the first picture, this kind of uh, geometric overall shape and the columns are placed inside. So it's representative again and in and, and, uh, and this the symmetry. So you got brought as a visitor through this column courtyard towards the other entrance. So you feel already like probably quite overwhelmed when you arrive at the second gate there. And then you got brought again through spaces getting smaller, 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 smaller while where, after you finally arrive at the dark red space, which is the most sacred temple. So when you arrive there, you already like went through a journey, right? An architectural journey, which really probably cleaned your emotion or influenced your emotion a lot. I really like these kind of dramatic. It's like a good movie, right? Starting relax and then ending up with the most interesting point, which is in this case, the temple, the, 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 the red inner temple the most sacred one yeah here are more pictures from that it's the same one that i showed on the picture before so it's i, I really like this kind of architecture yeah this is another example of the same sequences of rooms so you always see sequence 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 but in this case it's a necropolis so i wrote that what it is actually a city for the death so they build not just the graves in egypt they really believe like a life after that so they build for the dead people yeah they actually sometimes copy the whole palace. So this is like a, a palace, but it's not meant for living. It's meant for the king after he dies. So he can live, his ghost or his spirit can live inside that palace after he died. So it's really just for, yeah, it's huge. You see there, it's like, again, more than one kilometer long. And you see on the right side, these great sections of, of spaces again, covered, open, small, big, outside, inside. And you get brought to the inner core again, which is a small temple. But the whole thing, the, all the blue areas are for the king meant to live after he died. So it's we call it necropolis, city for the dead. So it's for the dead people. Yeah, this is how it looked from the earth. It's also pre, pre, pretty well preserved. And you have again the contrast of the horizontal laying form, very pure, without windows, without interruptions, and the standing entrance, polins, which, which mark the entrance. Yeah, that brings us to the pyramid. So that's my last topic for today i hope i can finish before 11 30 because i want to give you time for presenting your sketches from last time so the pyramids of giza are the most important ones but as i said it was a long journey to reach there so now i will explain these five steps oh no sorry five steps how you reach there first i explain the platonic solids that's why i find and i think the egyptian people thought thought similar so um first the pyramid is not one of these 
solids, right? And second, it goes back to a philosopher called Plato. And Plato lived in the Greek culture so much later, around 300 before Christ. So he lived after the Egyptian Empire and they didn't know Plato and they probably also didn't know these forms exactly. But, but Plato developed that because I think Plato thinks the same what I think and what modern architects think and what also the Egyptians, I think, have thought. So what we assume that they have thought, that what they thought as follows. So the gods are very important, right, for Egyptian, and the pharaoh was seen as a, as a living god. And God is, of course, something abstract and outside of this world, so it's kind of, we call it the absolute, so it's kind of spirit everywhere, just a spirit. And I think Plato, oh, no, from Plato we know it because we said it, we talked, he talked about it, that he believes that like intelligence is like the first incarnation of God's spirit. So the Greek weighted intelligence, the Greek philosophers, Plato was from Greek, around 300 before Christ, valued intelligence very high. So it's like, uh, let's say that the first level that we can reach, but intelligence like mind is not visible, right? So the next step would be math, mathematics. He, Plato thought mathematics is a very high discipline because it's also abstract. So it kind of works, it has its own logic. So it's kind of incarnated, it's not God. It doesn't belong to the side of God, it belongs to the side of our world, of humans. But it's abstract, you can't touch it, unlike physics. Physics is about the object, so the science of physics. So abstract, uh, math, he saw as a high, maybe the highest science, because it, it's abstract logic that works and this has no body, no shape. And then the next is the geometry. So the platonic solids, go back to Platon, are the most simple shapes. So they are real. I see you see a picture like a contemporary art installation that shows these solids, but they are describable by math. So it's a part of mathematics, so geometry. Math, this is the first incarnation. So they're physical, right? And but they're kind of expression of real of pure intelligence. So that's what Plato thought. That's why he valued them so high. And also the pyramid is not a real platonic solid. But you can see it looks close like the first one, like three triangles together, tetrahedron on the left. But actually it's an octahedron that you cut in the middle. So octahedron in the, in the second from the left has eight, um, eight um, surfaces. They are the same. When you actually cut it in the middle, you, you receive the pyramid, right? You get the pyramid and then the cube and so on. So there are these simple shapes. and. I also think it's kind of an expression of intelligence because it's the most abstract form that we can create. And as I said, abstraction is a form, ability that only intelligent creatures can. I mean, without intelligence, you can't think abstract, you can't summarize, you can't find the essence of something. You have to make it more elaborated, you have to speak longer. And when you're able to abstract, to think abstract, you can find the essence and make it shorter. So that's why I believe these pyramids, and, and we, we think, not just me, I mean, the historians think the Egyptians thought similar. That's why they make the graves for the kings that would then become a god when they died, the most abstract form they could thought of. So the pyramid is kind of the, the highest of the shapes because it's pure intelligence, kind of pure intelligence, which reaches the, that's what they thought, reaches the eternity, the closest. So the, what comes after the physical world, right? The the pure, yeah, the pure intelligence is that this expression of pure intelligence. So, but they didn't reach it in one step. They, they they took five steps to develop it. I will go through these five steps now. The first one is a very common shape. We also have it in Mesopotamia, the mastaba. So this is how they buried. Uh, um, aristocratic people and also kings. So the poor people couldn't afford it, but on the left, top left side, you see a simple shape, like a, a simple block. So this was kind of a grave, a normal grave to build, it, to grave, to, to bury um, aristocratic people, but not just the king. So everyone who had a bit of money had a, musta had a mastaba. And the more representative one you see on the top right side, this is a mastaba for a queen. And this is already <clears throat> actually covered, surrounded by a, probably a model of a palace facade that's how we know how the palaces probably have looked like the palaces are gone but those are built of stones the mastaba because they are again sacral architecture related to religion so they're preserved there you see a picture on the bottom how it might, how it looks now and on the top right side you see a reconstruction and we found something like this and the facade is actually like a 
like a king a king palace they they copied the king palace facade and the big mastabas like the one from the queen also has rooms inside so it's actually also to for the queen to live after she died same like the necropolis and it has small mastabas around it that's actually her um how you say her stuff her closest stuff and they go with the queen into death so actually when the queen dies all her servants the close servants they commit suicide that was the rule commit suicide and they were buried around her so they can also serve her when she's dead so the idea is the queen and also the king had similar ones <coughs> live inside that mastaba grave and, and the real body is buried inside so it's a grave and her servants committed suicide and were buried around her so that's the early shape so kind of a block and then it happened really in one step it's a king called Diosa. he lived around 2700 in the uh, third dynasty so it's at the beginning of the of the so-called old empire or old kingdom he found that this is not enough anymore and he had a chief architect called Imhotep and Imhotep it's there also some movies about it uh, Hollywood movies again it's like famous person he was the chancellor so the the the, the, the boss of the daily politics and I think also a doctor and um, physician and, and also the architect. So he, he got the job. So please find something more representative. And he, so there were like three mastabas built for the King Diosa already. You see M1 is the first and make it bigger and bigger, M2 and 3. But it was not enough. So finally Imhotep, the architect, invented this kind of um, called step pyramid. So it looks actually a bit like, like the Sigurat from Mesopotamia. And but it's not it's it's a different one. So I mean, the Sigurat is a temple on a on the top of a hill, and this is just a monument where the grave is inside. And they actually made two steps. P one is the first, and then they make it bigger. So and this was the shape where finally the king was buried. So it looks it's still preserved. It looks like this, um, a bit broken, but we can still see this kind of shape. This happened around two thousand seven hundred before Christ, and next one just 50 years later they actually experimented a bit more on the left side you see and these these three diagrams right you see in these three sketches first there was built another <clears throat> step pyramid we call it step pyramid we don't call it ziggurat in egypt but it looks similar and then they created as a interim form this kind of bent pyramid so it has a, a steep angle 54 degrees first and then in the middle it becomes flatter and then they build the third one so actually this is the real one how it looks today so it's still preserved quite well and in dashua and first i mean either it was really planned like this but we find it a bit weird why it's changing the angle in the middle and on the right side you see a sketch on the bottom right of the page just like this is theory some people thought they want to build actually a real pyramid a steep one but then the construction was not so easy and then they they kind of changed the plan and made it like flatter from the middle of the height so that was actually not planned like this but people don't know maybe they wanted to build a real one maybe they wanted it like this and just kind of tried out as an experiment and the same king then also built this one this has a flat angle of 43 degree it looks flatter than the real later ones which have done around 51 so the more steep one uh, it looks a bit strange right it's called the red pyramid we only have exactly one from this shape built by the same king that built the bent pyramid and in dashua and it's called Red Pyramid, and it looks already a bit flat, right? <clears throat> People assume because they had problems building the steep walls from this one, construction problems, they say, okay, now we build a real one, we'll make it flatter. So, and But it's still not, it, it looks a bit strange, right? And it, But it didn't take long. It just took another 50 years, and they start with the oldest one of the Giza. So they were built in the same time. The right one is the largest. I mean, on the top photo, the right one. It just looks smaller because it's in the back. And they were finally so in this kind of classic shape i mean the average would be 45 degrees right going up but this is the, the other one was a bit more flat two degrees under 45 this is 51 so it gets this kind of monumental shape of a pyramid and they were covered with like marble or granite so very hard stones so they were really like flat shapes in the desert i mean very strong shapes and the the surface is then removed later by 
yeah, I would say by kind of stupid people who want to build other stuff with it. So the, the marble or granite uh, surface was removed. There were very big blocks and just the middle pyramid, it's, it remains right in the middle one. Um, and they were built <clears throat> in sequences, but just within 200 years because they became too expensive. And then actually the, f the first empire, actually the old kingdom finally died because they spent too much money on the pyramids. So that's why the later empires didn't build so big ones anymore. They built some, but not so large. And as we can see here in the section, so the names are basically, by the way, Cheops, Cheprin, and Mukirinos, the Cheops or Cheops pyramid is the most famous one because it's the biggest and actually the oldest. So you can see down the plan that the pink one on the right, the oldest is the biggest and the chaperon is the one where the top is still existing. Maybe I can go back to that. So the middle one is the chaperon and the right and the back is the oldest. And this is a, a section through that Cheops pyramid on the bottom of the slide. And you see, it's basically just massive. It's, it's bricks, with, but it's a very, how you say, developed construction. They build actually like these vertical shapes that actually vertical walls that kind of support each other. So that's why they didn't get demolished over the years. And it's covered with a very thick layer, I think three meters or something, three meter layer of marble or granite. So very heavy stone, very dense stone. And, um, so yeah, they have a side length about like 130 meters, I think. So I think the highest is already like 140 something meters. So it's quite huge. And then the grave is inside, right? And the, gra the, the entrances were closed. But what's also preserved is uh, in the black drawing, uh, two temples, one on the left, uh, sorry, one on, on the lower part. So this is where the, the red drawing on the plan. And it's like an entrance temple. And then there's a long way, like a procedure way and you come out actually in front of the pyramid in a bigger temple construction which is about underground so it's mainly mass massive so you see the black drawing there <coughs> it's quite not added a temple but the pyramid itself is a grave monument right it's a grave for the king that then should become a god after he died so and this is kind of the highlight of it the pyramid so was the, the, the peak the very peak of the pyramid we found one or two and they're engraved again with the ornaments. So there you see again the, the essence of uh, Egyptian architecture. So the geometric abstract shape and then engraved with, um, with uh, floral ornament. So this piece was the very top to see as the highest piece of their architecture. Yeah, this was the Egypt architecture. I hope you enjoy that. I think, I've, I mean, I find this very inspirational again because um, yeah, it's 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 from our current perspective again quite modern in this abstract form, right? In this geometric form. Yeah, I hope you can find inspiration with that. <clears throat>